Today, we will talk about economic botany. And before we go on, let me point out the background of this slide. What you see here is a vine, and the vine has on it collections of flowers or inflorescences that are pendulous or hanging downwards. This vine turns out to be hops. And if you are of drinking age and a fan of bitter beers, then you're familiar with hops. Hops imparts the bitter flavor to beers, especially to ales and pale ales. And later in this lecture, we'll come back and talk much more about how beer is brewed. We'll start, though, by talking about what is economic botany and ethnobotany. They're closely related fields. We'll then go on, and we were going to talk about coffee and tea and chocolate, but really we're going to focus mostly here on chocolate and we'll mention the others in passing. Then we'll talk about alcohol, which is itself um, not a plant, but it is derived from the sugars that come from plants. And we'll talk about how alcohol is made. Then we'll talk a little bit about other psychoactive plants. We'll talk about medicinal plants and the future of medicinal botany. So that's what's coming up. Starting with economic botany, Let's define this term. Economic botany is the study of how people interact with plants. So this is going to incorporate several different fields. First, it includes ecology. We can define ecology generally as the study of the distribution and interactions of organisms with other organisms and with their environment. So part of understanding how people interact with plants is understanding where the plants are and where people find them. A second aspect of economic botany is anthropology. This is generally the study of humans, but in this context, we would think about the study of human society and culture. In other words, what are the cultural practices people use in collecting plants? How do they remember which plants are collectible? How does that information get passed down? And who in the society has this information? Does everybody participate or is there a division of labor? And if so, then how are the um, plants shared among other people? The field of archeology span is relevant, especially when we're trying to figure out when was the origin of something. For example, when were potatoes initially cultivated? Um, or we'll see some examples later of some psychoactive drugs, and we can find out something about when they were first collected based on archaeological evidence. Um, obviously, botany, it's in the title, and all of this is about plants. Moving on, chemistry is also important because many of the plants that we'll think about are going to have some effect on our physiology. And if they affect our physiology, then if we use a reductionist approach, trying to understand at the most basic level why that is, then oftentimes we have to go back to an understanding of the chemistry of the molecules that are causing the effect. Let's talk about some topics that are included in economic botany. So economic botany is the major category Ethnobotany is sometimes used interchangeably, but it's sort of a subset with a more particular focus. It asks questions about how do particular cultures use plants? The questions might be, what are different plants that different cultures use? Or how do different cultures use the same plant in different ways? We could focus on traditional cultures, but we could equally focus on modern or contemporary cultures and ask how do southerners compared to southwesterners use plants differently for example we can also think in economic botany generally about the origin of crops this is interesting um, for historical reasons but it's also interesting for very practical reasons if we can figure out where crops originated that gives us some idea of where we might find the most native diversity that could be used as a genetic resource when we breed the crops today.
So for example, we could ask where in the Andes did potatoes first arise and were they cultivated only once or were they cultivated repeatedly? We could ask what are all of the uses of a particular plant? So for example, with flax, we might ask what are the different ways that different cultures prepare flax and what are the different kinds of fabrics or other substances made out of it? And what are the different ways different cultures use flax seeds? We can ask, what is the chemistry behind the given use of a plant? And we talked about that a little bit already. And then we could also ask, what are all of the different plants used for a given need? For example, we could say, what are all of the plants that are commonly cultivated or collected for fiber um, to make natural fabrics? We'll shift gears here, and instead of talking about economic botany generally, let's talk about some case studies that are either of economic importance or of cultural significance. And we will start with one of my favorite plants, um, or at least favorite products, and this is chocolate. So chocolate is Theobroma cacao. This is the genus and species name. It is a small understory tree in the hibiscus family. It is native to Central and South America from southern Mexico through the Amazon basin. And I will try to skip ahead here to show you a map. So this is North and South America. And this red shaded area is the approximate area to which it is native. You can see that it has large green leaves these accumulate tips are called drip tips, and they're very common on tropical plants. They seem to help water that lands on the leaf move away and then fall off onto the ground. What we see over here on the right is what an actual chocolate fruit looks like. And so you can see there's the fruit capsule. This is not used. Instead, what's used are the seeds themselves, which have this white coating on them. Chocolate has been used um, from pre-European times in uh, the New World. It was originally used for pulp, um, specifically for the pulp that was around the seeds, and that pulp was removed and made into an alcoholic drink. And at some point there was a transition to use the beans as well as or even instead of that pulp. So we know that even in pre-Columbian times, uh, chocolate beans were used. They were consumed both in Mayan and Aztec culture, as well as other cultures. And there's a drink um, called chacoatl, if I pronounced that correctly, which obviously relates to the word chocolate itself. And this drink was made from processed seeds. It's however not something that we would recognize if we were to drink it expecting chocolate milk. Most importantly, it is not going to be sweet. In traditional um, New World cultures, there was not a supply of sugar, and therefore it wouldn't have been possible to make an overly sweet drink. So this drink was mixed with a variety of spices, and this could include chili, achiote, vanilla, and corn. So corn might give a little bit of sweetness and the drink was apparently used in religious ceremonies. This doesn't go back to pre-Columbian times, but this is a um, painting of a woman in the 1500s pouring uh, cocoa liquid from one vessel into another vessel. And so this is clearly something that was a cultural practice when Europeans arrived. We talked already about the Columbian exchange. Remember this refers to the period after the Europeans came to the new world when many plants moved in both directions, both from the old world, so mostly Eurasia, in this direction, and plants were actively brought back to Europe. So chocolate was part of the Columbian exchange. Columbus encountered chocolate but it's not clear to me that he actually ate any. 
or understood its significance. He just described the pods in a uh, canoe, I believe. But Cortez at least witnessed its consumption, and he might have also tried it. And so there were some clear records at that point of uh, chocolate's existence. And chocolate was brought back to the Spanish court when some Native Americans were brought from the New World back to Spain in the 1500s. They prepared the drink for Spanish royals. Um, thereafter, consumption of the drink spread throughout Europe. And because Europeans at this time were colonizing throughout the tropics, each European state then started developing um, chocolate plantations in whichever region they controlled that had an appropriate climate. So you can see that the chocolate plantations spread to West Africa, shown here, as well as South in uh, rather South Asia or India, shown here, and then sort of Austral Asia, these islands out north of Australia. And so there are now many places where chocolate is grown. Out of these places, the place that grows the most chocolate is actually this West African region shown here. Let's next explore a little bit about how chocolate is processed. This is going to start with cacao seeds from the Theobroma cacao tree that we already looked at. So we're going to pull those seeds out of the fruit. And the first thing that we need to do is ferment them. Your book talks about the fact that actually this isn't true fermentation because there is both anaerobic and aerobic bacteria without oxygen and with oxygen participating in this process. But with that being said, basically we are going to allow microorganisms to work on degrading the seeds for some period of time. And that is going to change the chemistry and it will probably also break down some of the carbohydrates. After that has happened, the next step is to dry the seeds and then roast the seeds. And at that point, we go from having fermented cacao seeds to something called cacao nibs. And one can buy cacao nibs at a health food store. They're not going to be sweet yet because no sugar has been added. As we've already said, cacao itself is actually bitter um, and not very sweet. So we've got cacao nibs. Our next step will be to heat them. And when we heat it, eventually it will become a liquid. At this point, we are going to start using the word chocolate. We can call this chocolate liqueur. It's not um, alcoholic, or at least it's not strongly alcoholic, but nonetheless, it gets this name. At this point, we need to separate the chocolate liqueur into two different components. So we'll separate it into the cocoa solids and the cocoa butter. I should point out here that for reasons I don't fully understand, the spelling changes at this point from cacao to the more familiar cocoa. So we have cocoa solids and cocoa butter. Out of these two, the flavor is primarily associated with the cocoa solids. And this can be powdered, and this would be um, chocolate powder. Some of it can be slightly more processed than others. So if you were going to make something yummy, you would be interested in using the cocoa solids. The other half of what we separate, and we're doing this separation simply by pressing the liquid. When we press the liquid, then some of it's going to come to the surface. That will be the cocoa butter, and the solids are what's left behind. So cocoa butter is pictured up here, and this is going to be... Um, I'm going to stop. We've talked now a little bit about where chocolate comes from. Let's talk about how it is processed. We will start with the cacao seeds from the theobromide cacao plant that we already talked about. And so we pull those seeds out of the fruits. The first step will be to ferment them. So we'll put them into a sort of moist environment. Now this is not true fermentation because in true fermentation, remember, it is in an, an environment without oxygen, so anaerobic. 
but when we do this fermentation, part of the fermentation will be with oxygen and therefore aerobic. That said, we are basically allowing the seeds to be processed by microorganisms. That will break down some of the sugars and other chemicals in them and change the chemical composition. At the end of that process, we have fermented cacao seeds. The next step will be to dry them and once dry, to roast them, which will um, again change the chemistry and develop the flavors. Once we have done that, then the dry roasted product is called cacao nibs. And you can buy cacao nibs at health food stores. They will not be sweet unless um, sugar has been added to them. Because remember, cacao seeds themselves are actually bitter. Um, and the sweetness only comes from adding sugar at the very end of this process. So don't buy cacao nibs expecting a sweet snack unless the ones you're buying have sugar added. The cacao nibs still have all of the other components of the seeds. At this point, we are going to heat them. And when we heat them, a liquid is going to form. And we'll call this liquid chocolate liqueur. Now, this is not a liquor. This is not alcoholic. Um, it just has a similar, similarly spelled name. This liquid has multiple components in it, but we can broadly fractionate it into two components. That is the liquidy component, the cocoa butter, and the cocoa solids. So basically what we'll do is we'll take the liquid and we'll press it. When we press it, the cocoa butter will come to the surface and we can skim that off. And everything that remains is then called the cocoa solids. The cocoa solids is where almost all of the flavor is. And you can see two different powders made from cocoa solids here. Slightly different processing happened, accounting for the difference in colors. When we take that liquid that separated off and let it cool, then it will harden into cocoa butter. And you can see it's called cocoa butter for its obvious similarity in appearance and color to um, milk butter. This would have a very light flavor. Um, it would not taste heavily chocolatey. So the cocoa butter portion that we just looked at is actually the lipid portion. And the lipids are triglycerides. So we talked about lipids earlier in the semester. Remember that triglycerides have three fatty acid tails, and I will draw an approximation of what that might look like. Remember there's some carbons across the top, and then three tails that are hydrophobic and are long chains of carbon with hydrogens attached throughout. So the cocoa butter is a triglyceride that will behave similarly to cow or milk butter or other um, saturated triglycerides. The solids portion contains, as we said, everything else. Let's specify what that means. It will include the carbohydrates. It's about half carbohydrates. There's also still some remaining fat that did not separate out and there's a fair amount of protein, and then there's a lot of other chemicals that are present in smaller amounts, but that will contribute to the flavor. So we now have the butter in solids, but if we're going to make a commercial product out of these, the next step is going to be to recombine the butter and cocoa solids together. You might ask, why separate them if we're just going to recombine them? Well, there's a couple reasons. First, when we recombine them, we won't use them in the same ratio. Depending on what we're looking for, we could add more cocoa butter, or hopefully, if you want a lot of chocolate flavor, we'll add less cocoa butter and more cocoa solids. When we mix it, we'll mix in a fair amount of sugar, and then usually milk, and sometimes some other ingredients like vanilla. And these will then start making a product that tastes like what we would expect if we went to the grocery store and bought some chocolate. Now, depending on how much sugar and how much milk is added, we might end up with bitter chocolate or dark chocolate or milk chocolate. 
We'll talk a little bit about the chemistry of chocolate here. It contains uh, many chemicals, but two of the most important are caffeine and theobromine itself. And this is where the plant got its name, theobroma. Now, I'm not actually sure if the chemical is named after the plant or vice versa. Both of these chemicals, caffeine and theobromine, are alkaloids. We should talk a little bit about what it means to be an alkaloid. So alkaloids are chemicals that contain rings that have carbon in them. So remember on a diagram like this, anywhere where it doesn't specify that lines come together, there must be a carbon there. So we can draw in a carbon here, for example, a carbon here, and a carbon here. And there's a bunch more. So it's a ring that contains carbon, but it also contains nitrogen. You can see caffeine has two rings with a total of four nitrogens, and theobromine has a fairly similar structure. You can see a few differences. So one characteristic of alkaloids then is that they are chemicals that usually contain carbon rings, they usually have nitrogen, and they are basic, meaning that their pH is greater than 7 on the pH scale. And th alkaloids are going to be important um, in ethno or economic botany because many of them have effects on physiology. Consuming them will affect how our body functions. Let's talk a little bit about the chemistry that underlies uh, physiological effects of chocolate. There are two compounds we'll focus on, caffeine, which you're familiar with, and theobromine, which you probably aren't. Both of these act as psychotropic stimulants. Psychotropic means affecting mental state, and stimulant refers specifically to psychotropics that quicken reactions or relieve sleepiness. Uh, these are both good things generally. However, relieving sleepiness can also cause sleeplessness if you need to sleep at night, and too much stimulation can cause nervousness. And so eating some chocolate might be a good idea, but for this and lots of other reasons, eating too much chocolate is probably not a good idea. And as you're probably aware, both tea and coffee also have caffeine, which acts as still a psychotropic stimulant. And there's some other alkaloids that do similarly as well. We'll move on here and start talking about alcohol, which has the reverse effect. There are many different kinds of alcohols. The one that we usually think of when we just talk generally about alcohol is ethyl alcohol, which is also called ethanol. And the common name for this is actually grain alcohol because we typically make it by fermenting grains. It is the primary product of fermentation by yeast. The second kind that I know you are familiar with is isopropyl alcohol, also called isopropanol. And I know you're familiar with this because we used it in laboratory a few times. This is called rubbing alcohol because a typical use is to apply it to the skin to sterilize the skin, for example. Now, this would be toxic if ingested, and so it should not be taken internally. I should point out in passing that ethyl alcohol is also toxic when ingested, especially in large doses. The third kind of alcohol we'll talk about is methyl alcohol, or methanol. And methyl alcohol is called wood alcohol because traditionally it would have been made by fermenting wood. It is present in small doses in alcoholic beverages, even though the main goal in making those is to achieve the production of ethyl alcohol or ethanol. And this is a problem. One reason is that it contributes to hangovers. So because methyl alcohol is especially toxic um, compared to ethyl alcohol, it takes longer for the body to process and it can have longer uh, lasting effects.
More importantly, methyl alcohol is a problem because in large doses, it can cause both blindness and even death. And so this is one reason that people say not to drink Applejack or homemade alcohols because somebody could accidentally make methyl alcohol without knowing it. Let's address the general question, why are we talking about making alcoholic beverages at all in a class about plants? Remember that in all cases, making an alcoholic beverage is going to start with a plant because the process of fermentation requires sugar, either sugar itself or starch that can be broken down into sugar. So there's three types of alcohol we'll talk about. First, beer. Beer is made from grain starch and sugar. Um, additionally, we have wine. Wine is made from grapes, and grapes have primarily sugars as their carbohydrate. And then we have the general category of spirits. And spirits will refer to alcohols that are made either from grains or from grapes, but after the alcohol is made, it gets further concentrated in one of a couple processes. And so spirits are going to always be stronger alcohol than the beer or the wine. Let's talk a little bit about the process of um, making some of these beverages. We'll start with beer. So in the process of beer fermentation, it always starts with a grain. The grain is not always barley, but that's the most common. So we'll use that as our example. So barley seeds are shown here. They have a lot of um, starches in them, and those starches are going to have to be made accessible to yeast. The way we'll do that initially is by moistening the seeds and warming them, and that will create conditions conducive to germination. When a seed is getting ready to germinate, it is going to need energy so it can make ATP. And so in anticipation of this, one of the earliest steps in germination is converting starch into simpler sugars. So our moist warm conditions allow this to happen, and the seed then is ready to power respiration except we then use it for the remainder of the process. When seeds have started to germinate, you can tell because their um, radicals will start coming out, so the embryonic roots. When that occurs, then they have been readied sufficiently for next steps. And when this has occurred, some of those starches have broken down to sugars, giving this a sweeter taste. This is called malted barley. And you're familiar with malt both um, in descriptions of beer, if you um, are a beer consumer, but you're probably also familiar with it from milkshakes. If you see a malted milkshake advertised, they're really advertising that there's a sugar that's coming from a malted grain. So we take our malted barley. Our next step is to mix it with water and also to add in any additional flavorings we want. In beer, hops is always or almost always used to impart the bitter flavor. Um, and other um, ingredients can be added as well. When that's done, the resulting product is called a mash. And the mash still has all of the solids in it because liquid was added, but the barley is still there as well. So the next step will be to drain out the solids. And when we do that, the liquid that remains is called the wort. The wort then is sterilized. It's already been strained. And once it's sterile, then an appropriate kind of yeast is added. Depending on which kind of beer is being made, there are a couple of different possible yeast. The yeast, because they are in a liquid environment without very much oxygen, perform fermentation. And one result of this is the release of carbon dioxide. The other result is the production of alcohol. That carbon dioxide is actually usually released into the environment. So that's not the carbon dioxide that makes beer bubbly. Instead, carbon dioxide is added afterwards before the um, beer is bottled. The process of beer production then was fairly involved. 
we had about what, five steps going from seeds to malt to mash to wort to beer. The process of making wine is considerably simpler. We'll start with grapes, and grapes have a lot of sugar in them, which you probably know from simply eating grapes. That means that the initial steps in beer production are not necessary here. We have the sugar already. So our first steps will be removing the skins if we're making white wine or leaving the skins on to make a red wine because the pigments are mostly associated with the skin. The grapes are additionally crushed to break open the cells and make the sugar more accessible. We now have grape juice, either white or red. To make that into wine, we need to add yeast, and we need to do this in an environment that has very little oxygen. In this environment, fermentation will occur, and the waste products will include carbon dioxide, which will be released, and additionally, alcohol. Alcohol will build up over time, and as it reaches around 18 or 20 percent, the yeast that are forming it will actually be killed because alcohol is toxic, both to um, animals and to yeast. So as the yeast die, then the process of fermentation comes to a stop. At this point, the wine is made. It needs to be filtered to remove sediment from the bottom, and it can be aged in either barrels made of wood, um, I believe oak wood, or it can be made uh, rather aged in vats. The barrels give it better flavor. After aging, then the wine can be bottled and further aged or consumed. We've talked now about various different psychotropic compounds, including stimulants and depressants. Let's now talk about one that is a hallucinogen. And this is going to come from the peyote cactus. So cactuses generally contain alkaloids because they are storing water and nutrients in an environment where there are not many, then it's important that they are well defended. Their needles are one way of being defended, but containing poisonous compounds is another. They obviously occur in dry environments and they tend to grow at ground level, um, specifically that is peyote. They grow almost nestled into the ground, they have a very deep tap root, but just this small protrusion above ground. This form helps them conserve water because they have very little surface area exposed to the air in which water can be lost. Peyote contains mescaline, and mescaline is responsible for the hallucinations. It is an alkaloid, and we've already talked about what that means. Mescaline is taken orally, and it has various effects, including modifying vision, as well as other sensory perception, and it changes individuals' perception of time. Exactly how this happens isn't known, but we know that mescaline binds to neurological receptors for serotonin, and then that apparently has some effect on other aspects of the brain. Because um, the drug is popular, then there's been illegal harvesting and over-harvesting of peyote, and it is now endangered in the United States due to this over-collection. There are ways of harvesting that would allow the cacti to continue growing, um, but instead, when it's harvested, it's often entirely dug up, which obviously means that the plant is dead and cannot grow back. Using peyote for most Americans is illegal, um, and there are a few religious exemptions, the details of which I'm not clear on. There are also other cacti that make the same compound, but it is illegal to use them for, um, as a drug. It's only legal to have them for aesthetic purposes. I'm not sure what other alkaloids are in the cacti, and so there could be risks both from overdosing as well as from exposure to other uh, toxic alkaloids. So this is not something I am recommending. We'll move on to a final example. This is a legal plant that is still used medicinally. And the plant itself is foxglove, which is pictured here. 
Foxglove is in the genus Digitalis. This one is Digitalis purpurea because it has purple flowers. And this is the source of the medicine Digitalin. This is one of our first examples of a drug being used in a scientific way where somebody studied different levels of dose to see which level was most effective. Digitalin is a cardiac glycoside. The glycoside means that there's a glucose attached and the cardiac is saying it has some effect on the heart. Specifically, Digitalin increased the strengths of heartbeats. And in some instances where somebody's heart isn't working very well um, or isn't pumping hard enough, then this is a good thing. The trade-off here is that if it pumps more strongly, then it needs to take more time between each pump. So it decreases the rate of heartbeats. And Digitalin is traditionally used for congestive heart failure. Back when it was first developed in the 1700s, this disease would have been called dropsy, presumably because as somebody's heart was not weak enough, that person would eventually drop over. So as I said, this was the first drug where doses were quantitatively examined. This happened in the mid-1700s by a doctor who was a contemporary and competitor with Charles Darwin's grandfather. We still use this today. Um, there are uh, various drugs that have this as the main ingredient. Dosing is important. Having too much digitalin could cause heart problems, just like for somebody who has symptoms, not having enough could also, of course, be lethal. This means that if you have um, congestive heart problems, then you should not be self-medicating. So what is the future of medicinal botany? Some people think that now that we can develop drugs purely in the laboratory, we don't need medicinal botany anymore. And it is true that we can create drugs without harvesting them from plants as we have done traditionally. However, others argue that plants produce a wide range of secondary metabolites. And secondary metabolites refer to chemicals that are in the plant that are not a required part of pathways known to be essential for the plant's survival. For example, pathways to make amino acids or to perform photosynthesis and respiration, those are necessary, so anything involved would be a primary metabolite. But secondary metabolites are usually involved in other things, for example, defense. Many secondary metabolites have the potential to affect our physiology, and so as such, they could be useful drugs. This means that screening plant compounds still can be a useful way, I'm gonna say a useful approach to discovering new drugs. Let's end today's lecture with some final thoughts. First, other lectures are focused on crop plants, but we should remember that crop plants are not the only important ways that we interact with plants. And so when we think about things like wild plant collecting or drug discovery or cultivating new crops, those would all be examples. Second, there are very few wild plants that we can just go out and eat. If you just went outside and started eating things in the forest, you might not die from it, but you probably wouldn't get adequate nutrition and you would probably encounter things that make you sick. Um, the latter part, getting made sick, is because plants tend to have defensive compounds. And while these compounds are usually there to deter us from using them, Sometimes we can use those deterrents in ways that actually benefit us. We saw that with digitalin. Usually having something manipulate our heartbeats would be a bad thing. But if we know when we need our heartbeat manipulated in a certain way, then we can use that compound to our advantage. Finally, I'm going to end with the thought that traditional knowledge can be forgotten as culture changes.
especially in an era where there is homogenization among different cultures and where pharmaceuticals are replacing uh, traditionally collected uh, plants. And so I won't say that that's a bad thing. I'm a, a big fan of modern medicine. However, before that knowledge gets lost, it is useful for us to retain as much of it as possible because it can contain clues about what different plants can be used for, whether medicinally or for um, other uses. And so ethnobotany is a important field as we go through cultural changes today.